Hello, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Sabrina Hanna and I'm the Executive Director of the Save Your Skin Foundation. Today's webinar, part of our Changing Face of Cancer series, will focus on global perspectives on the changing face of cancer. And today's webinar is going to explore the evolution of cancer treatments and the cancer patient. Why new innovations in cancer are exciting and how scientists and researchers are harnessing these new innovations to find a cure. We are very privileged to have with us today Dr. Jason Luke, a medical oncologist and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. Dr. Luke's research focuses on translational therapeutic advances for melanoma and early phase drug development, particularly immunotherapy. He serves as the national study chair for the only ongoing national clinical trial for patients with advanced uveal melanoma and is the principal investigator of several clinical trials of immunotherapy and targeted molecular therapies for melanoma and advanced cancer. And prior to joining the University of Chicago, Dr. Luke was an instructor in medicine at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, where he treated patients with melanoma and performed early phase clinical trials. Dr. Duke, uh, Dr. Luke joins other interested investigators at the University of Chicago Medicine in creating a comprehensive research program for melanoma and immunotherapeutics for cancer. Also with us is Dr. Marcus Butler, who's a medical oncologist and clinical head of the immune monitoring team at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. After serving on the Dana-Farber staff, he joined the Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in 2012 and is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He cares for patients with melanoma and gynecological malignancies. His research interests are in the translational development of immune-based therapies for cancer patients. His work focuses on the development of immunotherapy trials, which which includes studies alone and in combination of immune checkpoint blockade antibodies, immunomodulators, and adoptive cell transfer. He received his MD from Yale University and trained in internal medicine at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He then completed a hematology oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard, Boston, Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. So, so thank you both of you for being with us today. And uh, before we get started on our presentation, I just want to remind everybody who's listening in that uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of the uh, panel discussion. And to the right of your screen, you'll see that there's a little box for you to type in your questions and send them to us. And uh, you please feel free to send those as they come to you or uh, at the end of the panel discussion. And with that, um, I will uh, hand over the microphone to Dr. Luke. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come uh, to this event and to speak to this audience. Uh, I was given the task of discussing uh, treatment options for melanoma uh, as they exist in the United States. Um, and you can see on my slide here the title there where I'm going to firstly discuss really the explosion in new drugs uh, for, for metastatic or advanced melanoma that have ha has happened over about the last six years. Um, and then sort of start to talk about how we're now moving those drugs from the situation of using them when the cancer can't be removed uh, to the setting where perhaps we can use them to keep the cancer from coming back. And we call that adjuvant therapy and we'll come to that in just a second. So because I don't have my webcam on, I put a, a little picture of my mug up here so everybody can see me. So uh, talking about treatment options for advanced melanoma is really uh, one of the most exciting areas of all of cancer research. Um, so before 2011, unfortunately, metastatic melanoma or advanced melanoma had very poor outcomes. Um, patients did quite not well, um, and that was due uh, to the fact that uh, there were very limited treatment options that were available. So before 2011, really the available treatment options included chemotherapy, uh, as with other kinds of cancer. Unfortunately for melanoma, uh, chemotherapy tends not to be one of the most effective sort of modalities. Um, and another treatment that was an option was the immunotherapy treatment interleukin-2, which while it had approximately a 10% chance of engendering a long-term benefit, meaning patients didn't have progression or recurrence of cancer over many years, perhaps decades, and might in fact even be cured, it was a very toxic therapy that had to be given in an ICU or a step-down unit of a hospital, and therefore it really was not amendable to the majority of patients who had this disease. So therefore, patients had very limited options and they did not do well. 
Things are quite different, however, now. And so and note here this was 2015 and now we're in 2017 and things are even expanding further such that there's been a huge explosion in the number of available treatments. So we've learned a lot now about the genetics of what makes melanoma grow, uh, identifying what have been referred to putatively as driver mutations, meaning mutations in the cancer that specifically make the cancer grow more, and that if we could design drugs specifically to block that effect, it could make the cancer shrink. And some of those mutations are listed here. If you see underneath where it says targeted therapy, for the mutations in the gene called BRAF, there are a couple of different drug combinations now approved. So they have names like dabrafenib and trametinib, or vemurafenib and cobimetinib. For other mutation targets, there are other drugs being developed. So for the uh, molecule called KIT, or mutation in KIT, there's a drug called imatinib that was previously approved for leukemias that has effectiveness uh, for this kind of mutation. And then there are a number of other mutations listed there, GNAQ, GNA11, NRAS, NF1, MEC1. These are all mutations we can find in decreasing frequency of patients with melanoma, all of which to some degree we can treat with a class of drugs called MEC inhibitors. And so these targeted therapeutics can be really useful for treating melanoma. They sort of work like antibiotics in that they're usually uh, oral pill-like therapies. They tend to have a rapid onset of activity and often can cause the tumors to shrink quite rapidly. Uh, and that can be really, really useful in the clinical setting if a patient is having pain from cancer or other symptoms. Um, the sort of upside and downside, however, is that while they work quite quickly and can control the tumor, they do sort of work like antibiotics in that over time, in the majority of patients, the patient will develop what we refer to as resistance in the tumor, where the tumor will learn how to grow around the use of these drugs. And so they work to varying degrees over a certain period of time. And we're only now starting to learn how to optimally use these and which patients to employ them, but they really changed the game in the management of melanoma in that it allowed for us to get disease control even in patients who had very rapidly progressive cancer. Um, and that uh, really now serves as a backbone that we, we need to test patients' tumors for these mutations so we know which ones are potentially available and amendable to the use of these drug therapies. So the other area of uh, rapid uh, movement in the field of melanoma therapeutics and now more uh, across uh, all diseases uh, in the cancer setting has been the development of these immunotherapies. And I mentioned up at the top immunotherapy in the form of interleukin-2, uh, which is a molecule that's given to try to just sort of non-specifically activate the immune system. The real breakthrough has been that over the last couple of decades, it's been identified what the sort of on and off switches in the immune system are that help us to uh, regulate our immunity, and especially our anti-cancer immunity. And so perhaps one of the most important of those is a molecule called CTLA-4, and you'll see that about halfway down on the screen here, highlight with the arrow. And that's sort of sometimes referred to as the master off switch in the immune system. So once your immune system gets turned on, we uh, you're automatically will start turning off your immune system in sort of a natural physiologic loop to try to avoid autoimmunity. And so once that was recognized, it was realized that, oh, maybe we could develop drugs against that, and that eventually did come forward in the form of this drug called ipilimumab. Uh, that really set the stage because whereas about 10% of patients could get benefit from interleukin-2 over a long period of time, it's now clear that with ipilimumab, that number is more about 20 to 25% of patients. So clearly that's not good enough yet, but we're making uh, dramatic strides in terms of long-term survival with patients. The next step in the immunotherapy trail was identification that some of these immune cells that get into the tumor sort of sit there and are dysfunctional. And that's an area that Dr. Butler has studied quite a bit, and I'm sure he'll talk about a little bit later on. But in that content text, there's been uh, investigation around what are the mechanisms whereby the tumor will block the activity of those immune cells that have come to kill the cancer. And that led to the identification of this molecule called PD-1, and it's cognate uh, ligand called PD-L1, or programmed death ligand 1. And that turns out to be a really, really important molecule in the immune system, much more important, in fact, than I think most researchers and doctors initially had thought, uh, such that if we develop drugs to block that in the form of these drugs, pembrolizumab or nivolumab, um, we see sometimes quite dramatic responses in patients with immediate shrinkage of the tumor, sometimes with long-term effect. And we really haven't had these drugs long enough yet to know how long they're effective in some patients, but we know that in a fraction of patients, perhaps 
in the 30 to 35 percent range, they seem to be doing very well at about five years of treatment. So we talked about 10 percent and then 20, 25. Now we're in the 30, 35 percent range here with these. And then the sort of most recent update has been combining these drugs together, uh, thinking that perhaps that would generate the best uh, overall clinical outcome. And that has been done in the form of combining this drug ipilimumab with this drug nivolumab where we see in early data series that the initial benefit of treating the patient in terms of what we call the response rate has been increased quite a bit. Um, the downside is that as we start to add these drugs together, we see that the side effect profile of giving them seems to go up and somewhat dramatically. So currently in the area of melanoma, there's a debate about which the best treatment for an individual patient might be to give one of these PD-1 drugs or this immunotherapy with a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab and that's really a patient level decision in conjunction with the discussion of the risks and side effects with the patient's doctor. It's important to point out that in the immunotherapy space, it's not just these checkpoint blocking antibodies as I've sort of discussed here, but in melanoma cancer, we've actually also had the first approval of a modified oncolytic virus. In other words, we inject a virus into the cancer that the patient has with the idea that the virus will cause the cancer to start to die and perhaps recruit in more immune cells than to kill the cancer. And we refer to that as virotherapy. And the first of these drugs to be approved is this molecule of TVEC, uh, also known as Talamagene Laher Paretvec, and you can take that offline and try to say that 10 times quick uh, after the uh, WebEx here. But the idea again is that this normal herpes virus that infects all of us, you know, think of cold sores, um, can be modified in the laboratory to carry human immune genes so that when we take a needle and we, we literally inject the virus into tumors, say on the skin or in the lymph node, that the virus then will replicate in the tumor and make more virus, uh, but also uh, release immune particles that cause the immune system to come in then to fight the cancer. So this is quite an exciting area of research as well. And all of these treatments that are listed on this page are actually treatments that are available as part of standard of care therapy in the United States. And so you can see how there are many, many options and how it might be confusing for patients and even maybe even for doctors. And I'll sort of, sort of summarize and end up this portion of this uh, discussion about these systemic therapies for metastatic disease by saying, well, obviously questions arise about what about giving these BRAF therapies with these immunotherapies? What about giving these virotherapies with immunotherapies? What about other newer drugs that are coming forward? And obviously all of that is happening as well a little bit outside of the scope of the conversation right now, so I'm not going to get into all those details, but to suffice it to say that we're expecting that even more drugs are going to be approved for melanoma in the near term, I would say, over the next two to five years. So it's a very exciting time in melanoma. And that's sort of highlighted here by what we refer to as a Kaplan-Meier survival plot, where you can see that those patients who had metastatic melanoma with M1C-based melanoma based on our staging system here. These are people who have melanoma involving lung or, or sorry, our liver or other organs. They did quite not so great before 2011, and here you can see their survival over time. So if you take the median survival, meaning 50% chance of survival, and you here, look here at about a year, you can see that that was about 25%, and obviously that was terrible. Uh, th with the development of all of these new drugs, however, that number really now is unknown for patients with melanoma because we have all of these options. And in the individual clinical trials for these different BRAF inhibitors and these immune therapies like we've talked about, the median survival was about two years. So then if you start adding them up, we don't really know what an individual patient will get. Now that being said, I'm always very cautious when I talk with my patients about expectations because I don't tell them that these drugs necessarily are going to cure them but rather that we have seen some patients that go on, could go on for a very long time getting these treatments out over years, and uh, that can be very hopeful um, and with the idea that perhaps we might be able to get them symptom-free with disease control out over a long period of time. So that's really a summary of the treatment of uh, advanced or metastatic melanoma in the United States. Uh, the sort of next step then is what about thinking about using these treatments after we would have done surgery to remove the melanoma. And that's generally speaking in the situation of stage three melanoma or patients who had melanoma that had traveled to their lymph nodes that was then removed by surgery. And we call that kind of treatment after surgery adjuvant therapy. 
that's listed here. Uh, and these are options in the United States for the consideration of adjuvant therapy for high-risk melanoma after surgery. And what you can see is that there are multiple options. This is an area that's highly controversial, um, and I'm sure that's true in other parts of the world as well, such that a standard of care option is not to do treatment, meaning to consider observation only for patients, and that's due to the potential toxicities that are associated with some of these treatments I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But absolutely, for patients who have had lymph nodes involved by the melanoma, we would recommend that at a minimum they get seen by the doctor every three to six months and really consider whether or not to do PET scans or CT scans, so on and so forth. In terms of treatments that they can take, however, in the United States now for about two decades, there's been approval of this drug called interferon alpha for the administration to patients after they have had removal of their melanoma. Uh, that drug, again, is controversial because the benefit of that therapy is rather modest, uh, meaning in large-scale meta-analyses are looking at multiple clinical trials. We see that there's an advantage in terms of improving the survival of patients on the order of about 5 to 10 percent. So that's something, but that's not really, you know, really changing the game a ton. And the problem is that this treatment causes a lot of side effects. So interferon alpha is a natural molecule that your immune system makes when you get the flu. So you can imagine what happens if we give people very high doses of it. They get very bad flu-like symptoms. And for some patients, that will be just kind of feeling crummy, but for other people, that means ending up in the hospital. So that can be a pretty tough treatment, and a lot, some doctors advocate it, but some doctors don't. Another treatment uh, that really isn't given too much anymore is this biochemotherapy. It's still available in the United States, although I don't think people do it very much. Uh, this is really giving high doses of chemotherapy and immune therapy at the same time. I really think that's only uh, used in isolated places for consideration of patients where we think that the risk that they're going to develop metastatic disease is almost 100%. So I'm not going to talk about that too much because we, generally speaking, don't advocate for that anymore. But I am going to mention ipilimumab which I mentioned on the previous slide, was the first of these immune checkpoint blocking antibodies that was approved for melanoma. And so we know, again, like I said, that in the metastatic setting, after cancer has come back and can't be removed, about 20 to 25 percent of patients who get this drug will have long-term benefit out over many years. So that was a good rationale then for the consideration of this drug after surgery to see if we could keep the melanoma from coming back. And in fact, uh, now recently reported, that does appear to be the case, meaning if we give ipilimumab after surgery, it looks like there's about a 28% improvement in the survival of patients relative to those who did not get, a, get who got placebo in this clinical trial. Now that is controversial as well because unfortunately the treatment with ipilimumab after surgery is associated with a fair amount of side effects. About 40% of patients who get the drug then get uh, fairly substantial side effects. Uh, meaning they may need to be hospitalized for them. So doctors have a disagreement about how many patients should get the treatment and which patients should really get the treatment and so on and so forth. And that's really, again, a conversation that each individual patient should have with their doctor to discuss the level of evidence and how it relates to their situation. But certainly it is considered a standard of care. But the summary in this area is that no treatment or observation is considered standard. Well, any of these treatments would also be considered standard, although I think most doctors now say if they're going to give one, they would give the ipilimumab. So, but it does highlight that this is an area of active investigation, especially in the United States, because we don't think that just these options are really enough. Um, I talked in the last slide about how we had these other options with BRAF inhibitors, as well as PD-1 antibodies. And so we would really advocate, and obviously here at the University of Chicago, uh, that a clinical trial would really be preferred and that's really almost universally true. Uh, we would really, our preference would be that patients consider participating in clinical trials so that we can find better drugs that are even less side effects. And, and to that effect, I thought I would sort of finish up here by uh, just showing a slide that identifies the ongoing high profile clinical trials of the different drugs being used after surgery to try to see if we can keep melanoma from coming back in the first place. And I don't want to go through the whole details here, but rather just identify that some of them go after those BRAF mutant tumors, as I mentioned here. Some of them are using the interferon drug or the ipilimumab drug. Some are using the PD-1 drug, the pembrolizumab, or the nivolumab drug, as listed here. Uh, and now, most recently, we have a clinical trial of looking at the combination of immune therapy drugs versus other immune therapy drugs. So there's a lot of things going on, and I think that really the future of melanoma treatment is, to a large degree, going to shift 
from treating patients after melanoma comes back to treating them after surgery in the hopes of never allowing it to come back. But, you know, that's really going to be the future, but it does identify how we still need patients to consider participating in clinical trials because despite all these great new drugs, we both don't necessarily know how to use them in the optimal fashion, and we, we don't need to want to sit on our laurels and feel like this is good enough. We want to continue to push forward, hopefully with the intention of curing more patients. So with that, I'm going to say thanks so much, and I hope that was a good overview of all the drugs that are available in the United States for the treatment of melanoma, both when we can't remove the melanoma as well as after surgery. Uh, and from there, I'm going to pass it back to the moderator and eventually over to Dr. Butler uh, for discussion about uh, their considerations in Canada. Thank you, Dr. Luke. Um, Dr. Butler, it's, it's all yours. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to chat. So what I thought I would do is take Dr. Luke's uh, slide that shows all of the, the drugs that are available uh, and then talk about what's available in Canada and some of the differences between what we have here uh, versus in the U.S. So uh, just as uh, Dr. Luke uh, explained, uh, chemotherapy and uh, high dose IL-2 were options for patients uh, in the years before 2011. Most patients received uh, chemotherapy. High dose IL-2 uh, for a time was given in Alberta and uh, in Ontario and in other provinces, we sent patients to the U.S. for, for high-dose IL-2 as it was only available for uh, fit patients who, had a, who were very otherwise quite healthy and uh, it was economically more feasible to send patients uh, south. But since the, uh, the introduction of these new agents, uh, High dose IL-2 is very, very rarely used for, for, for patients with melanoma in Canada. Uh, in terms of the targeted therapies that are currently available, uh, we do have uh, dibrafenib and trametinib, as well as uh, vimurafenib and cobimetinib. These targeted therapies um, are uh, in the process of being fully covered by the provinces. Currently, the dibrafenib and trametinib are covered by the provinces. However, uh, vimurafenib and cobimetinib are only available through uh, the company's um, uh, programs as well as some private insurance uh, programs. The, most of the provinces are not uh, uh, covering vimurafenib and cobimetinib. Now, the choices between these two drugs really has to do with uh, side effects that are involved in, in these agents and uh, depending on a patient's uh, um, challenges with uh, the side effects, it guides us in terms of which of these agents to give. Um, imatinib for patients who have a kit mutation that's present in the tumor is used, uh, but uh, is not, uh, doesn't follow a Health Canada approval but rather the, the observation in the literature that patients that have uh, kid mutations can benefit from uh, this agent, and most of the uh, provinces will approve uh, use uh, of the agent. For patients, private insurance will approve it uh, in ex extenuating circumstances, but you have to go through an approval process in order to access the drug. Um, in terms of uh, the MEK inhibitors for patients that have these other types of mutations. This is a, within the area of, of research. Most, uh, uh, most in private insurance plans and none of the provinces will approve uh, these agents. So in order to access these agents, um, uh, patients usually are participating in clinical trials. Now in terms of immune therapy, uh, one of the distinct Distinctions between the U.S. and uh, the uh, and the Canadian centers are that uh, most of the provinces currently have approved one line of immunotherapy. We're not able to use and administer uh, uh, two different lines of immune therapy in sequence. Uh, currently, for Health Canada approvals we have 
uh, approval for all of the agents under the immunotherapy category. Ipilimumab is approved for first and second line according to Health Canada regulations. Pembrolizumab and nivolumab are also approved. And also, Health Canada has recently approved ipilimumab and nivolumab as a combination therapy for patients. However, uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab is still undergoing a, a, a cost effectiveness and, uh, and a medical assessment through the uh, interprovincial agency called PCODER. We're expecting to have results from that assessment uh, in early May. So currently, patients are uh, receiving ipilimumab and nivolumab through private insurance or self-pay, but are not receiving these agents through a provincial uh, funding mechanism. The nivolumab and pembrolizumab uh, are uh, available. Uh, nivolumab has lagged uh, pembrolizumab in terms of uh, funding. We really do, Dr. Luke and I both think of these two agents as being quite similar. Uh, pembrolizumab, uh, according to label, is administered every three weeks, nivolumab every two weeks. So most patients end up on pembrolizumab for metastatic unresectable melanoma. Uh, however, uh, in terms of the uh, challenges that we have with this uh, single line of therapy, uh, because comparing head-to-head -head, uh, pembrolizumab and, or nivolumab compared to ipilimumab, the uh, Pembro and Nevo are much better. Most patients will put, be put onto these agents because it's a better response rate, better survival, and also less side effects. And then, unfortunately, in Canada, the only way to get ipilimumab is through uh, private funding or insurance. It, these are not currently covered by most of the provinces. I will also just mention that there is a challenge that we have in Canada in regards to the targeted therapy and immune therapy in terms of sequencing. Some of the provinces, although not all, will require that patients receive targeted therapy first and then immune therapy second uh, rather than vice versa. Uh, however, other provinces will allow uh, uh, targeted therapy before or after immune therapy. One of the questions that comes up uh, with my patients is what if I put a patient on targeted therapy because uh, I felt that they would benefit uh, quickly from the, this uh, combination therapy. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, well, can I switch to immune therapy uh, as soon as, you know, after a few months of treatment? Uh, that is uh, the subject of clinical trials and to try to understand what the best uh, strategy is for uh, administering these agents. But it has to be understood that uh, once you switch between uh, targeted therapy and immune therapy, many provinces or insurance companies will say, well, you can't go back uh, to the targeted therapy later. And then in regards to uh, TVEC, uh, this is not approved in, uh, the, in Canada. Uh, it is the subject of a clinical trial that is ongoing where patients receive pembrolizumab and uh, injections of either placebo or TVEC. Uh, I do not think that uh, TVEC as a single agent is likely to be approved uh, within Canada because the insurance company, sorry, the uh, drug company is really focusing on combination therapy rather than single agent. Uh, in terms of adjuvant uh, therapy, <clears throat> currently in Canada, uh, the interferon is the only approved uh, treatment. Biochemotherapy used to be used in some centers in Canada, but is not uh, current. Most, most centers are not uh, uh, giving uh, this agent. And ipilimumab is, while approved for metastatic disease, does not have a Health Canada approval for uh, adjuvant therapy, uh, but is uh, part of uh, clinical trials, such as the 915 study that Dr. Luke mentioned, uh, which is about to open uh, uh, on both sides of the border. So 
concurrently, if a patient presents with high-risk disease, uh, interferon alpha is uh, or observation uh, are the standard of care treatments. Uh, ipilimumab is not uh, yet approved and probably won't be approved until um, until uh, more clinical trial data has matured. In terms of uh, whether or not ipilimumab could be uh, uh, administered off-label, uh, that is a possibility. However, the cost is extremely high. The dose of ipilimumab uh, that has been studied in the adjuvant setting uh, where we have data that uh, shows survival benefit uh, is a high dose, the 10 mg per kg dose, and therefore it's extremely expensive and uh, most insurance companies would not uh, approve it. Uh, and the, there really is no data to use uh, a, a lower dose. So I think part of clinical trial is really the way to go because uh, ultimately we need to uh, find out what the best treatment is for our patients. So I think that uh, covers what the, the differences between uh, these strategies uh, and, and treatment options for patients between uh, where we are in the U.S. and Canada, we have basically most of the, the, the agents are available on both sides of the border. There are some issues in terms of coverage with provinces, and certainly private insurance can uh, uh, pick up the gap in, in several of, uh, of these uh, agents, um, with several of these agents as well. Uh, currently, the biggest challenge we have is the fact that we have uh, limited access in terms of second and third lines of therapy uh, for patients. And uh, so uh, being informed about uh, the agents that are out there, the relative value of these agents is, is important for uh, physicians and, and patients alike. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to start the conversation by asking, um, so we've, we've seen a lot of uh, developments in the way that cancer is treated over the last few years, mainly with the immunotherapies, you know, a, a lot with the targeted therapies as well. But do you think that we'll see um, other breakthroughs in cancer care and cancer treatment uh, I, in the next 10, 25, 50 years? Well, this is uh, Dr. Luke. Um, I actually, the answer is absolutely yes, um, because I think one thing that I'll point out is while we've had the development of these new drugs, uh, we don't at all really know what the optimal way to use them is in terms of one before another, one in combination with another, so so on and so forth. So at a minimum, we will make incremental gains in terms of better understanding how to use these drugs. But then beyond that, we're learning a lot very quickly in terms of understanding which patients are most likely to benefit from them and how we might develop what we refer to as biomarkers that can better select up front which patients will get the best benefit. Uh, even then beyond that, um, uh, there are a lot of next generation developments of how to use these immune cells particularly. And I'm going to leave that to Dr. Butler to discuss because it's really his area of expertise. But I'm going to note that um, while on, on my end, what we really focus on are what are the factors at the interface between the immune cell and the tumor that are making the immune cell either not recognize the tumor or are causing the tumor to stop the immune cell from having its activity. And there are a whole bunch of new kinds of drugs that are being developed in that space. One that we're very interested in is an, an enzyme called indolamine dioxygenase. And again, everybody doesn't have to write that down. We call it IDO. We think that looks very promising and it fits our paradigm of mechanistically understanding how the immune cells interact in the immune uh, tumor micro environment as we call it, or the area just around where the immune cells meet the cancer. So we're doing a lot of things to better understand how can we get the immune cells to better recognize the cancer, how can we make them more functional, and all of those approaches will lead to new drugs. But I might throw it over to Dr. Butler maybe to talk specifically about maybe using those immune cells directly as a drug, as that's been something that he's been particularly interested in as well. Uh, yeah, hi. So um, I, one of my coworkers just brought their baby into the office, so I'm very impressed right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So uh, in terms of, of the sort of things that are going to happen in the next uh, few uh, years, I think, is that we're going to get smarter in terms of which, uh, uh, which drugs are going to work best for patients at, at uh, the time of presentation and, and also which drugs are going to be best for patients when they, if they have relapse or don't respond to, to treatments. Uh, so biomarker uh, work is extremely important, and uh, while it's it's certainly uh, not uh, pleasant to undergo additional biopsies, uh, it's going to be critical both for understanding uh, how patients are going to benefit and who's going to benefit uh, for future uh, generations, but also I think ultimately we're going to be able to figure out uh, uh, things about the patient's tumor that will help direct uh, care for, for the patients themselves in the future. In terms of manipulating immune cells uh, in, and in a more direct way for uh, uh, therapy of in, immune therapy, there are two different concepts that uh, are uh, currently being uh, developed in the clinic. One is to use immune cells by themselves as a, as a treatment where uh, either tumor or peripheral blood is, is obtained from a patient. And then uh, in the laboratory, uh, we manipulate these cells as a therapy and then grow large numbers of these cells in the laboratory and reinfuse these cells uh, to uh, patients um, uh, in either the hospital or in the outpatient setting. And this kind of strategy has shown uh, some initial success in melanoma uh, using what's called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, partly because of the, uh, the challenges of, of generating these cells in a timely fashion, and also because uh, patients require a high-dose chemotherapy and also IL-2 therapy after infusions it hasn't become quite as, as a widespread as the immune checkpoint inhibitors, but it is an area of research, and we're trying to look at this as a way to rescue some patients who don't respond to anti-PD-1 uh, therapies. Additionally, uh, there's a strategy of gene engineering T cells from the purple blood to then infuse into patients, and that's an area of active research that has actually shown a lot of progress in uh, uh, lymphomas and leukemias and is also being uh, 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 looked at for uh, patients with uh, solid tumors. The, the, another important area is uh, the concept of, of using uh, fancy molecules that are able to uh, connect the T cell to the tumor. This, these are sometimes called T bites or bispecific uh, molecules. This is a type of, of uh, treatment that's in clinical study where uh, uh, these molecules will uh, be able to directly engage in the tumor and then attract uh, T cells to bring them closer to the tumor and activate them as, as, a, as a therapy. Uh, this is an area that is currently being investigated uh, for uh, melanoma as well as uh, uveal melanoma and uh, uh, will be opening soon in uh, some Canadian centers and uh, has shown some early promise in, in uh, early phase trials. So I'll uh, take, we should take the next question. Yeah, so it's, it's, immunotherapies have been really exciting and it's it's good to know that there's still exciting stuff coming down the, the pipeline. Uh, you both talked about biomarkers and I was just wondering if you can help us understand uh, how these biomarkers are going to help um, oncologists understand uh, which patients are going to respond, which patients are not going to respond and how that's going to affect cancer care moving forward. Sure. Well, I'll so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just speak uh, quickly. So it, it is an area of active research that uh, I don't think we have the perfect biomarker yet for melanoma. 
uh, in lung cancer, for if, you know, if you start Dr. Butler, well, we lost you. I may have had an issue there for Dr. Butler, but I think what he was going to say was that um, you know the development of these biomarkers is difficult. Um, conceptually, uh, biomarkers can include basically any sort of um, observation that will sort of better inform us about which patients would benefit from treatment. So perhaps the most obvious biomarker that I mentioned so far was the mutations in the like the mutation in the gene BRAF. Because if we find that that mutation is present as the biomarker, then we know we can give the BRAF-directed drugs. So that's very helpful because we know about half of patients have BRAF mutations. Now, it's not a perfect biomarker because not all of the patients have their tumors totally go away, but it does tell us because the patients who don't have the BRAF, it doesn't work at all. So that's useful. Uh, in the immunotherapy space, biomarkers to date um, that are most available sort of clinically have focused on this molecule called PDL1, a uh, program death ligon 1. And I mentioned how that's a molecule that the tumor will use to block the activity of an immune cell. So it therefore makes sense that if we were to check patients' tumors to see if they have the PDL1, then if they have it, then we could give the drug. And that in general does work. The, however, it's sort of the counter argument also works, which makes it not optimal. In other words, this is a really, and this is a very, very important point for those that are listening. If a patient's tumor is found not to have the PDL1 biomarker, that does not mean that the drugs will not work. There's about 10% of patients who do not have the PDL1 where the PD1 drugs still work. And so that makes it a problem. And that's what Dr. Butler was starting to get to, but how it's not a perfect biomarker. So in the United States, we don't do that test very often because it doesn't really tell us which patients not to give the treatment to. But it's, it's sort of in general useful, and it proves this sort of point that we're trying to make. Uh, now, that being said, as we take this forward, there's a lot of research being done to try to look at how can we optimize these kinds of tests that we would do. Uh, can we look at the DNA? Can we look at the RNA, like what genes are turned on, to tell us more broadly which, you know, which tumors have the right molecules or the right sort of setup that we can give the right drug to make the patient actually do better? So biomarker is a broad term. It can be applied in many ways, but in the context of the drugs that we're talking about, the idea really is can we better tailor the individual drugs to the patient? And there's really no question that over a very short period of time in the near future, our ability to do that will get much better. Thank you, Dr. Luke. So with all these um, changes in, in the treatment landscape, we're seeing cancer patients that don't look the way they used to look even five years ago. So they're not going through chemotherapy. They're not necessarily losing their hair. They're still getting side effects. But how, how do you think um, a cancer patient will look? Uh, well, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the cancer, how the cancer patient has evolved since uh, the advent of, of these new treatments and what the cancer patient will look like moving forward. Well, in terms of what a cancer patient looks like, I think um, I would personally not like to be overly hung up on that. You know, I think um, just like anybody else in life, people look like what they look like, and we value the people, and I'm sure that's not the intention of what you meant, but I think it's important to highlight that, you know, even patients that are going through chemotherapy that are having a difficult time, obviously, I don't know that that's necessarily the be-all, end-all, but I think to the point that you're trying to make is that the side effect profiles of these newer drugs, because they're sort of better tailored, I think, to the patient is, is, is better so that people tend not to have as much of the systemic side effects and sort of debilitating problems that came with chemotherapy. So generally speaking, our patients that are getting the drugs that we've discussed today tolerate them very well, continue to work full time, and in all honesty, most of the time you would hardly even notice that they have cancer at all. Now, that's with gradations. Obviously, if the treatments aren't working, patients can start to look sicker and, and do not as well. And so, but in general, we find that these newer drugs really facilitate a more active lifestyle for patients, uh, usually with a higher quality of life than what they would have otherwise expected in the context of chemotherapy. So we think that that's all very exciting. Now, it's not to say that these treatments aren't without any side effects, and Dr. Butler mentioned some of that a little bit earlier, uh, but rather that in general, patients do well. Uh, they do sometimes have, uh, you know, difficult times and do sometimes need to be admitted to the hospital. 
Uh, but that being said, usually recover relatively well as uh, relatively quickly as well. So, so I would say that in general, uh, we're excited about this idea that we can increase the effectiveness of the drugs while decreasing the potential side effects. And then in the context of your question, I think that that will then lead to people having higher quality of life and really having less in terms of overall side effects from all of this treatment. Thank you. And I, I think we have Dr. Butler back online with us. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, uh, so, sorry about that. No, it's no problem. Uh, Dr. Butler, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about um, so in the in the oncology world, we don't we don't talk about a cure, but do you think that we're getting closer to that? Yeah, I mean that's a the uh, the the new C word is whether we can or actually affecting cures in patients, and I think that uh, we are getting, especially in melanoma, we're getting closer to where we're having uh, long term. A significant benefit for patients where they're not bothered by their cancer and uh, for some patients. So uh, that looks like a cure. There are patients in the world who have had a melanoma uh, removed uh, and then will have a metastasis uh, show up uh, 10 years later. So we can never really say you're completely out of the out of the clear with melanoma, but we are having patients that are receiving these new immune therapy drugs or even targeted therapy drugs where some patients are just doing really, really well and are not uh, relapsing from their disease. So time will tell, uh, but we definitely are having patients that are able to return to normal lives, have families, and have uh, uh, basically symptom-free uh, life. Dr. Luke, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that that's a good summary. You know, I think the hard part is, uh, you know, the C word carries a lot of connotation. And in cancer treatment, we have to just be real careful about what the exact meaning of the words that we use do mean. So, um, you know, some of our colleagues do tell patients that their intention is to cure the cancer. Um, I take a little bit of a more measured approach uh, because, you know, for each individual patient, before we start the treatment, I really don't know what's going to happen. So what I tell them is we're going to absolutely do our best, uh, and we do know that there are a fraction and an increasing fraction of patients who are able to live for many years doing very well with high quality of life, and that's really what we're shooting for. And I kind of put it in the context of other kinds of uh, diseases that people have. You know, 20 years ago, Patients who developed heart failure, it, it, was one of, it was like the leading cause of death in the United States. And yet now, almost no one dies of that. And yet people still have heart failure their entire lives. And my hope is that over time, perhaps we get to a similar situation for melanoma and for cancer more broadly, where we can control this cancer for a long period of time. Uh, as to whether or not the patient is, in quotes, cured, we may or may not ever really truly know that. But if we get that patient to feeling well, having high quality of life and enjoying their life and being productive, to me that's really the overriding point. And that's really a great analogy with the heart failure. So you see, so you see the possibility of cancer moving towards a more chronic disease? Yeah, I think so because I, um, you know, even if we give treatments, and some of these treatments we've talked about today can cause the patient's tumor to completely go away. And sometimes we can even then stop the treatment. But, you know, we continue to see those people every three months or, or whatever that schedule is. So, you know, even if they don't have the cancer, we can't see it. You know, they're still coming to the doctor and so on and so forth. So whether or not we're still giving treatment or we're just following, you know, we're, we're still going to maintain a, a high degree of suspicion that we need to be monitoring people closely. So I really think sort of setting expectations. And, and quite frankly, in my practice, it's, it's not usually the patient or even their immediate caregiver where this sort of issue becomes, you know, really the, the heart of it. It's really the associated family and the other people that interact with the patient. Where they're, they're all asking, them, well, are you cured? And, and what's the stat? Are you know, and whereas the patient usually has a better sense of all of this to say, well, you know, things are going well and that we're doing the best we can and, you know, these are the goals that we have. So I, I would really caution also people who are on the line and listening who are really caregivers or third parties to this situation to, to realize that part of the compassion that we have for people who are undergoing cancer treatment 
is trying to have empathy for their situation. Because you can just imagine that even if a patient has their cancer entirely go away, probably for the rest of their life, they'll be at some level in the back of their mind thinking, could it come back? And so uh, that has to be part of the way that we engage with people. And I think setting realistic expectations is a good way to do that. Thank you. Dr. Butler, did you want to add something to that? No, I, I agree that uh, I think we're, you know, we are in a new era where patients with this diagnosis are having to make decisions um, about uh, whether to start a family, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. and whether to plan for the future. And uh, it is it is a difficult, in many ways, a difficult uh, uh, area for people because You've kind of gone through whiplash where you you had your whole life ahead of you, and then all of a sudden you're being told that your life is limited. But then uh, come out the other end where there's a possibility of having a long-term survival. So uh, this is an area that uh, all of us are are uh, trying to help uh, people with in terms of uh, making long-term plans. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take a few questions that we've got from uh, the people who are listening in. And I've got one that's asking about um, what patients can do to help oncologists uh, overcome these roadblocks in Canada. So Dr. Butler, that's directly related, that's directed to you. Yeah, so I think it's a, it is a, a great uh, question. Um, and the one of the one of the important elements is that patients can do is to understand that participation in clinical trials actually is one of the ways that we are able to overcome roadblocks. Certainly, you might be able to access a new drug through participation in the study, but more importantly, these the clinical trial data is what is used by the provinces to justify um, to justify the the access to drugs, so you're not only helping people for the future, but also yourself uh, when you participate in a study. In terms of advocacy, uh, I think that uh, the uh, the 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 melanoma patient advocacy groups have spent a lot of time. Uh, talking to legislatures and to uh, talking with the province provincial ministries about uh, timely access to uh, uh, to agents, and I think that um, having being self-educated in terms of uh, what is out there and what the relative value of of the treatments are is uh, helpful in in terms of uh, educating. Uh, the ministry about uh, what what is important. So, uh, if if patients are not insisting to have access to treatments, then the the easiest uh, uh, solution is to deny uh, the coverage. So, I think uh, being aware of what uh, what therapies are available and uh, understanding what the relative benefits are. Uh, and then educating uh, your local uh, officials is uh, very important. Thank you. I've got a few um, treatment-related questions. So in the adjuvant setting, do you value endpoint of progression-free survival for overall survival? Uh, well, this is, this is Dr. Luke. I guess uh, I would say we value both. Um, so after surgery, there are, you know, uh, sort of two issues. One is how long does it take for the melanoma to come back? And the other one would be how long until, you know, how long does the patient live? Um, and we have done research in the past, quite a bit of it, that suggests that the patient's quality of life decreases rather dramatically once they know that the cancer has come back. So while some have argued that we should really only be focused on long-term survival, the patient level data suggests that patients care a lot about whether or not the cancer has come back. So to me, there's value to both. Um, and one other point I would make to this effect is that in the context of all of these different treatments that we now have, it's going to become more and more difficult 
to sort out what the impact of any one drug is on the long-term survival of the patient. So this is an issue that's been uh, in play in a number of other kinds of cancer like breast cancer and kidney cancer for a while, such that it's very difficult to then follow what the sequential impact of giving various different treatments over time really is. And so many regulatory authorities and definitely the uh, US FDA have suggested that relapse-free survival um, or even progression-free survival in the metastatic setting uh, is a reasonable surrogate for long-term survival. And doctors argue about that, which is why I'm sure we're getting the question, but those are the different sort of pieces and the different contexts to it. Um, I think those are valuable endpoints, and I think they've been validated on a patient level. So I value that input on both sides. Dr. Butler, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree that the uh, that progression-free survival has benefit and needs, and I think that uh, this is also where uh, when patients are participating on studies and they're asked uh, to fill out endless questionnaires, it's actually important because uh, from a from a payer point of view, uh, progression-free survival may impact quality of life, and uh, if there is not uh, any difference other than sort of radiographic scans or a biopsy, uh, then the payer is very unlikely to decide to uh, move forward with uh, a particular therapy if a survival difference isn't shown. But if you can demonstrate that patient's quality of life is significantly enhanced because there's no relapse, then uh, we're, you're more likely to get uh, payers to, uh, uh, to go forward and, and uh, pay for a particular therapy. So uh, progression-free survival is used as a surrogate for uh, overall survival. There are examples, however, where progression-free survival is exactly identical, but overall survival is different. Uh, that's uh, one of the uh, aspects of vipololumab doesn't have a very good response rate. It doesn't, uh, PFS in some of the studies or progression-free survival is not significantly different, but then you'll see an overall survival difference. So uh, both uh, measures are important and understanding uh, the nuances is ultimately what's going to uh, help uh, decide which treatments are, are the best for a particular patient. I have a question about how BRAF influences options for care, and I think that you've uh, touched on that. But maybe you can talk about how BRAF um, influences option for care and how it differs uh, between Canada and, and the U.S. and even within Canada. Well, I mean, in terms of uh, BRAF uh, status, it certainly increases your options for treatment. And patients who have a BRAF mutation, have a reasonably, a quite good chance of significantly benefiting from uh, BRAF inhibitors, even when the disease is, is uh, it has uh, grown significantly. Unfortunately, uh, patients who have uh, symptomatic bulky melanoma, uh, metastatic disease, uh, while they may benefit from a BRAF inhibitor, uh, the benefit can sometimes be short-lived and resistance can develop. Uh, and the patients who have low volume disease can also benefit, definitely benefit from BRAF inhibitors. Those patients are the ones that do best on the BRAF inhibitors in terms of long-term disease control. So um, we're in a situation where in the past we, we used to think that if you had bulky disease, you go on a BRAF inhibitor. If you have low volume disease, then try immunotherapy first because immunotherapy may take time uh, to kick in and you have the luxury of time in those situations. Um, currently, in 2017, it looks as though uh, patients who have low volume disease do the best with both targeted therapy or BRAF inhibitors as well as immune therapies. So uh, the, we are challenged in terms of knowing uh, what to do for uh, what the best course of action will be for patients with bulky uh, tumors. There, are, uh, there is a clinical study in the U.S. where patients are being uh, allocated to either targeted therapy or the ipilimumab-nivolumab 
uh, combination treatment. Uh, that uh, study will hopefully help to answer the question about what is best first for uh, patients with BRAF mutation. And then also there are studies that are ongoing looking at uh, combinations of immune therapy with BRAF and, and MEK inhibition, and I think that uh, study is going to be very important to uh, trying to answer the question of combination therapy, whether it's uh, the best uh, strategy. I'll, I'll let Dr. Luke uh, speak more. Well, I don't know that I have a lot to add. Um, so I think uh, that's really a patient-level discussion still uh, about pros and cons and the different side effects and what, what really is going to maximize the uh, sort of quality of life for the patient. So I think both are very reasonable approaches at this time. Right, well, it's uh, now 12 o'clock, so I don't want to uh, let this go over over time, but I just want to thank everybody for um, participating. I would like to thank Dr. Luke and Dr. Butler for being with us today. I would like to remind everybody who's listening in that um, you can listen to this webinar uh, on our website. It will be archived there in uh, 48 hours or so. And to find out more about our upcoming webinars, you can sign up for our newsletter, um, and you can do that at saveyourskin.ca. So thank you, both of you, for being with us. And uh, thank you to everyone for being on the line. Thanks so much. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh.